What's up, everybody? Hey, good morning, good afternoon. <laughs> we are here in beautiful British Columbia in my parents' backyard. This is my dad, Dave Heifetz. Hi. <laughs> love you, Dad. I uh, love you, son. Um, and today we are going <coughs> to talk about the history of the vintage clothing business. This man, the Don Dave, was there since the very beginning of it, since day one. What year? What year did you start selling clothes? 1967. 1967. Yeah, I had a little, I had a bookstore called the University Book Co-op. It was in Durham, New Hampshire and uh, did great, but only for three months. And at the end, middle of November, the book business died because everybody had their books. And so I put in a little section of uh, funky clothes and Pipes and papers. Okay, let's start. Let's, let's let's rewind here. Let's rewind. So, that was your first business venture as a bookstore. Yeah, that was my first vintage business thing because I had a. But what was your first ever time becoming an entrepreneur? Like, when did you know you were actually going to be an entrepreneur? <laughs> wow, that was a long time ago. My. Uh, How did you fund? Did you fund your own college education? Or the, the Actually, my dad was great. He paid he paid for my first college, the whole thing. Which was what, UNH? No, I went to Akron U Okay. in Akron, Ohio. And they sent me there, paid for the whole college, got me clothes, bought me a bag, everything. I went there for about three months. And then uh, I was a cheerleader with another guy from Pittsburgh named Weasel. I was the zip and he Male was Male cheerleader. You yeah. hear that? Yeah. The stigma is not true. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, it was fun. It was really fun. We had a great time. Weasel and I were the only guys ever invited to the fraternity football parties. We had a great time. But I got in trouble with two other guys in the dorm. And uh, So wait, wait, wait. You can't just brush over this. Yeah. How did you get in trouble? Oh, man. We were playing cards one night and drinking beer, about seven or eight of us, and I think we got pretty whacked, and it was 1963, and I had a roommate nobody liked, and including me, so we did a really crazy thing. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> give, you have to give us an a, a overview of this. We took some lighter fluid and put it under the door at one in the morning and lit it, and this guy... So he's in the dorm room. He's in the dorm room, and he jumped out the window and broke his arm. He jumped out the window of the dorm room. Yeah, he jumped out <laughs> the window of the dorm room. Uh, that's called hazing. Hazing, yeah. Or bullying, I'd say. It's yeah. pretty bad all around. It but was bad. This is the 60s, so you get a pass. So I got a pass. They threw me and two guys out. So that was the end of my relationship with my dad and money. So how long did you? how long were you there? Less than a year? Three months. Oh, that's it. Wow. So I came home and I uh, I hung out. I got a job as a waiter, the only job I ever had really, other than a grocery bag boy. I did really well. It was the Christmas of uh, 1963 it was the primary. So I got to wait on this hotel dining room on guys like Frank McGee, Walter Cronkite, all the big... Uh, CBS and NBC guys. Yeah, it was fun, but my dad gave me nothing. So then, what's the next step? What was it from there that you went and started your own thing? No, then I went to St. Anselm's College, and I was pretty well just uh, doing the waiter job and going to school. And then finally, I got accepted at the University of New Hampshire, and I transferred. I think that was '65. And my first real business venture, I became the business manager for the UNH school paper. Cool. 1965. And so you weren't writing or anything? You were running no, the day-to-day -day at the paper? I was mostly doing the advertising, getting all the local businesses to advertise. and There was no internet in 1965. Definitely not. Definitely not. So everybody advertised through the paper or on radio or TV. So, so uh, I did good. What was your sales tactics? How'd you get how'd you get customers and advertisers? 
I just told them if they wanted the kids market at UNH, the best place to get it was the weekly paper. And uh, I got a lot of ads for the paper and it was Yeah, so basically before pre-internet days, advertising would have been radio, radio, paper, newspaper, magazine, magazines and TV. TV. Yep. That's most, it. Most guys couldn't afford TV, local guys, they never did TV. So most guys did local radio and newspaper and magazines and we were cool cuz we were the only paper that came out weekly at University of New Hampshire and I did good. Cool. And I got paid a small commission and had fun. So keep moving forward to your first solo business. What was it? My first solo business. First time you made money on your own. It, well, I I went and sold signs when I was 15 door to door. What about drugs? You ever sell drugs? Never sell drugs. <laughs> My brother, my brother Ricky sold drugs. Okay. He became a lawyer. That must tell you something. Huh? There you go. So I sold a lot of paraphernalia. You can learn a thing or two. Yeah, I sold a lot of paraphernalia. So my first real job, I had a store. I mean, that I made money. I had a little uh, bookstore. In the in a couple of summers, at UNH, I got a job with a guy named Bill Caradonna. He had a paperback distributor company, and he hired me in the summers to. Wow, to distribute books with him, I had a VW bus. Nice, classic. Classic, I had a My VW bus. My son Hudson bus. would love that. Yeah, I had a VW bus, and I'd go up to Portsmouth or Portland, fill up the bus, and go to all the local retailers and drop off books. So <laughs> explain this. So you were working for a distributor. These were new books, right? These were new books, and I was working for the publisher who had his books at the distributor. But this is still someone else's business. Someone else's business. Okay, so fast forward to your own business. So How does this after pertain? that, after that, um, I asked Bill Caradonna if he'd help me open up the first private bookstore at UNH. It was called the Booksmith, the University Booksmith. Actually, we call it just the Booksmith. And uh, I sold all the funky books, everything to the left, the Ramparts, the Village Voice. All kinds of uh, offbeat Allen Ginsberg books. Uh, I got them all through the, the two distributors I knew, one in Portsmouth and one in Portland. And then I started ordering books and magazines directly from some of the publishing houses. And I had this funky, cute, like 500 square foot, 400 square foot bookstore. And I had a great time. I hired my girlfriend and her sister and they helped me. How was business at that time? Business was great. And then the second semester... Who was your customer base? Was it all the students? It was students, professors, local people. Because I had lots of magazines that nobody else had. Like uh, the Ramparts or the East Village Other. So explain to these people that don't understand what that is. What what, what were those magazines? Like counterculture? They were counterculture music, magazines. Music related stuff? Music, counterculture, rock and roll, hippy dippy trippy. Hippy dippy trippy. Yeah, poetry books, political satire, political statement books. I mean, I had a funky, funky magazine book rack. Cool. Because I know at some point you transitioned into selling used books, correct? Yeah. So explain how that went in to well, the af transition. After that and during the Booksmith. What year are we talking? 66? 66. Okay. 66, early 67. Or, yeah, and I think, uh, and then I met my buddy, I had a roommate named Bill Adams, and we both knew a girl whose brother started the first head shop in New Hampshire, uh, in Manchester. So Bill and I had a little shop uh, called the Grasses Greener. It was a tiny little thing, couple hundred square feet. We got that all- That was the first shop, the Grasses Greener. That was the, one of the, that was the second head shop in New Hampshire. The first one was in Manchester, and the second one was in uh, Durham. My, nice. Bill, me and Billy. Yeah, okay. And then after- So, explain the mix. What, what was in the store? Oh. Well, first of all, a head shop, for those of you that don't know, at the time, head shops don't even exist anymore because weed's legal in half the places, but a head shop would have been the place to get all your counterculture, literature, uh, 
probably had some clothing at the time, maybe. Um, yeah, Not really. but mostly funky tie dye stuff. Music? Music t shirts, sometimes music. We had a very small shop, so we had pipes and papers, rolling papers, incense, a few posters, uh, you know, maybe uh, some funky candles, maybe a couple of tie dye t shirts or a Beatles t shirt or. or Rolling Stones. It's basically the store your parents didn't want you to shop at. Exactly. Very much so. Because <laughs> yeah. you bought counterculture stuff there that uh, promoted smoking. It was, it was on the edge. Marijuana. It was the, the everything that was legal to have fun doing illegal things. Yeah. Especially pipes and papers. Uh, no one wanted you to sell pipes and papers. Side note. So when myself and my brother were... Um, I guess I was probably 13, Jesse was 14, well, Jesse was 15, maybe even younger. We found my dad's stash of pipes from back in those days. He had saved a huge bag, a grocery store bag full of pipes, metal ones, glass ones, wooden ones, crazy intricate artistic pipes and all this stuff hidden in the basement in our sump pump room in the wall with like a two by four shoved up against it so you couldn't really see, but you know, we found it, come on. Had some hash in there. Um, Get out! I don't, yeah, oh you, come on! It had some hash in there, some weed in there, oh, and then we slowly, you know what you do when you're, when you're, when you're dipping into your parents' stash, like with the alcohol, you'll, you'll have a drink, and then you'll think, oh, they won't notice, and you have another drink, then you think, oh, they won't notice, and the next weekend, have a couple more, and then by the time they go back to their bottle, you've drank the whole damn bottle, so that's what happened with the hash. Jesse kept taking some, smoking it. And Fourteen. It, yeah. <laughs> you knew this you don't remember anyway um we found a stash that he kept all those years but back to 1966 so after 66 uh, billy got drafted in 67 or 60 yeah we closed the store and uh so was business good at that store business was great i mean it was a tiny store we had fun bill and i were both in school by the way i was in school all this time in the philosophy department Taking a full curriculum. So, yeah. Busy guy. Busy guy. Lived in a place called the Coop. Do you have any stories from, the, from that from that era of that store? Like any any crazy stuff happen in and around that store? I don't, I don't like, remember. Wh where were you living? Where, who were you living with at the time? I was living with a guy named Eric Buzza, a guy named Frank. Were you guys have a house or a dorm? We or? had a, a townhouse in a place called the Coops. It was right behind the Theta Chi fraternity and all my buddies were in Theta Chi they were football players they all went to uh, Memorial High with me so was was the Theta Chi the cool frat house to hang out at it was, yet? It was the part coolest they used to get they used to get uh, soul bands down from Boston <laughs> doing the temptations and the four tops and yeah I used to be able to go to all the parties because I knew the guys but it was basically a jock fraternity and I they all are, aren't they? No, no, no. There was, there was uh, smart guy fraternities. <laughs> there were cool guy fraternities. Yeah, there were all kinds. Uh, of fraternities. When I think fraternity, I just think jock. But no, I guess I never went to school in a, in a, or university in America. So no. Okay, so let's move on yeah. to the next step after after this store closed. What happened? Well, that, that, did you have money in your pocket? I don't know. I always had some money. I always had money in my pocket. I had my own car. I always paid my own rent, my own food. I always had a pretty nice girlfriend. I had a pretty steady girlfriend for a long time. Can't remember her name now. Kitzel. No, no. Kitzel was a uh, Carol Dion. Carol Dion. Carol Dion. Carol Dion. She was my girlfriend. Have you ever looked her up? Never. She was from the next Carol time. Dion, if you see this video, no, please reach out. On, please reach out to us. We want to talk to you. We need to interview you about this time period of your life with <laughs> oh Dave. My God. Okay? It was crazy. We need to know if he was just as crazy then as he is now. No, I'm not crazy. I'm just... <laughs> How can I be crazy? I had three kids. I had good ones. I had a wonderful wife, and uh, we had a great dog for almost 14 years. Anyway, listen, so after the head shop and the bookstore bookstore I think I had the bookstore for two years the head shop for a very short period of time so was this after that store was when you went to use books or did we already pass over these no books? no no then I one of the guys I used to get a lot of advertising from was a guy named Lawton Connors 
and he had a um, office equipment business in the next town over, Dover, New Hampshire. But he sold a lot of stuff to the profs and the administration and the students of UNH. They buy printers and whatever they had in those days. Typewriters. A lot of typewriters. Yeah, there was no printers. There's typewriters. There's typewriters. Primitive typewriters. Yeah. Anyway, uh, no, there was a few pieces of equipment. Anyway, Lott and Connors had a building in Durham, in Durham, New Hampshire. And uh, I don't know how it happened, but he and I decided the second, the second year of my bookstore, I got a lot of book orders from the philosophy department and the so social department and the art department. So that's like the school ordering like like 100 books at a time. That's from right. Just give to the students. But the students, the school didn't order it. The professors ordered it. And they and where'd didn't the order Where'd the money come from? Oh, the kids came in and bought them. Okay. So it brought a ton of traffic. And instead of giving the bookstore the order, they gave me the order. So I, I got the order for a lot of, a lot of courses. My second year at the, at the booksmith. So then I went to this guy, Lawton Connors, and I said, hey, I think I can get a lot of orders, and there's no place in, in town that sells used books. We should open up a bookstore together. He liked the idea. So he gave me his building, and we opened up the University Book Co-op. Cool. And we got a lot of book orders, and we bought used books back from the previous semester that they were using again this semester. And so I was the only store that sold used books. It was really fun, So man. whose idea was that? That was my idea. So how did this whole buying of used books work? Kids would just bring them in the store, you hand them cash, and that's sell it. them. What was, what was your margin on a used book at that point? About uh, 350%. So you're paying 10 bucks, you're selling it for? Three, 35 dollars. 35 bucks. Yeah. But, and you nobody know, was doing this, you said? Nobody. Not even at other universities? No, but other universities, lots, but not okay. at ours. And That's hustling, people. <laughs> that is like original hustling, okay? You got to find a niche, you got to find a hole in the market, and you got to fill it. And there right? was a great hole. There was a chasm. There was a chasm. <laughs> there was a chasm, man. So it's easy to start filling. I mean, a lot of people would just take their books home or throw them out. And the books were expensive. Away. A new book is... Ridiculously expensive, right? A, a really textbook? expensive. I mean, those guys would go and spend thirty, forty, fifty dollars for an engineer book. Yeah, have, which now in in today's dollar, you're talking like three hundred bucks. Yeah, it's pretty much money. I mean, most of the average books were like four ninety five, five ninety five. The novels, the small philosophy books on Hume and Descartes. Anyway, yeah, and I got I got involved with Barnes and Noble. I got involved with Texas Books. I got involved with. A lot of book companies that's all they did was sell a lot of used books so when I got an order I ordered from the used book companies as well as the new book companies and I bought back from the students so we became very very popular I'll never forget the first time we opened we charged a dollar for the membership it was called the University Book Co-op Ah, because it's a co-op you had to have a membership you had to be a member and so you have another to... ingenious idea, people. You see that? <laughs> oh, <no>. Memberships. <laughs> what do you mean? That's great. So they all joined, and uh, I had like almost half the campus there the first day to get their books because I had an exclusive on the philosophy department, half the social, a bunch of art books, a bunch of psych books. They had to come and get their textbooks from me, plus, a lot of them could get them from me used for other courses. That's super cool. Yeah. So how long did we run this store for? This store, I think we run ran it for three years. Three years. And so we're talking like 66 to 69. Oh no, because you were out by 69. No, I was, I left on, in, uh, yeah, la end of 69, 70. Okay. Early 70. So this is UNH now, yeah. correct? How was, you were in school at UNH for part of that time? I was in school full time. The still. whole three years? The whole time. But did you did, did you graduate? You know what? I got 157 co co uh, credits between uh, Saint Anselm's and UNH, and I never I I did my thesis, but I never finished it. 
So was there a point, like obviously you're hustling at the store, you, you're running the store, it's making you good money, right? Yeah. You're, you're studying, but you're probably studying like part time because you're like, I'm already making money. No, I was studying you're pretty You're studying full time? Yeah. And then was there a point like during that schooling that you're kind of like, I'm, I don't need to, I don't need this education or was that never a thought? Yeah, around, around mid to late 68, I, I cut back on my courses. So 69, I didn't take a lot of courses. It was too crazy. I'd already had my head shop for a year in the summer called Xanadu. In the summer, we closed the bookstore down. So, um, and then in, in the fall and spring, there was very little book business except buying back books for the next semester. So I had a section of the store where I opened up a little hippie shop. So you you were like now you're a bookstore head store head shop. Well, it wasn't really. We didn't sell pipes and papers. We sold posters and some music and so some this clothing. is still that this is still the UNH store. The UNH yeah. uh, University Book Co-op because our business died and the rent was the same and you still had to have employees and you know the business dies after the big rush you make a lot of money, boom. Yeah, totally yeah. seasonal. Totally seasonal. So then you you left someone in charge of UNH and you went to the beach summer I closed the store okay, down close the store you go tell us so tell us about your beach beach shop Xanadu I had Xanadu for three what, summers what town Hampton Beach New Hampshire which in the summertime is just popping right? just popping just just rock we're talking and like you know spring breakers here kids at the beach partying all summer big get, time getting summer jobs just having a good time yeah and they had a casino there that wasn't a casino it was an old casino they closed down and a buddy of mine and his dad bought it, and they had everybody there. Three Dog Night, Steppenwolf. I mean, they had all the big bands that at so this cool. So they, they shut the casino down and made it a concert hall? They made it a concert hall. They, they, and that's all they did there, throw parties? No, no parties. It was concerts. Four, well, yeah, that's what I mean. They threw co concerts, yeah. but that was it. That was it. That was that's it. That's awesome. It was a whole block wide and he rented shops, and in the middle of this casino, old casino, was a huge concert hall. And we called it the casino, and they had great groups. I mean, they had famous, famous people. And then I, at the head shop, was the only outlet at the beach that sold the albums. Oh, so after the shows, everyone's rushing your store to get the albums. They get the albums, I had this huge rack, and the back of the store was a wall with black light posters, and then we had counters with uh, pipes and papers and sunglasses and funky, uh, I don't know, posters and anything that were hippie ch shirts with band names and tie dye. So, so rewind a sec, go back to this shop. So this store, you started summer of 67, 66, what? Uh, Summer of 67. Okay, summer 67. Or 68, I don't remember. Was it, was, okay. it must have been 67. Were you solo entrepreneur or did you have a partner? No, it was my store. Okay, so you roll to the beach. You're like, let's find a spot. We're going to open up a store just for how many months? Three months? Four months? Yeah. And then you... So every summer when you went back to do the store, did you get the same location? Yep. They just were... Because what did they do in the winter? Nothing? Nothing. It was empty. Half the beach was, most of the beach was empty in the winter. No one went to the wow. beach in the winter. Hey, we should go and get it for mom now. No, we'll, we'll get her a sec. Okay. She, I told her we're doing this. We'll, oh. get, we'll finish a half hour. Okay. Okay. We'll cut that out. Okay. Back to this. So, uh, my first store ever was also a summer venture. Summer ventures are a wicked way to get into business because you can like, you can test the waters of something. You can jump in to like a super busy scenario at the beach or in my case was Whistler and uh, there's no commitment you can be gone so you do a three month stint and you can be gone and if you don't want to come back you never come back if you want to go back you go back the next summer and if your summer venture is good enough you can basically make your whole year's worth of money in two three months you're right um, so back to this though so you went and you found the space you decked it out you had a head shop this is the same head shop um, model so you're talking you had pipes and papers you had music right yeah you had posters posters what else tell us about the tchotchkes had, you had in there we had t-shirts we had wind chimes funky wind chimes we had uh, uh lots of sunglasses 
uh, lots of jewelry, funky bracelets, hippie bracelets, hippie necklaces, lots of peace jewelry with peace signs, peace t-shirts, uh, you know, anything that uh. the hippie trippy, headbands, uh, funky peace bandana, anything I could get that was funky and cool. Hey, Sage, come here. Let's find it. <clears throat> Sage! <laughs> come on. Um, yeah, okay, so, that's my dog. She's running around the yard here. It's, um... sage matic Yeah, sage matic right here. Sage, come on up. Come up, on up. Up, 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 up. Sage, up, hop up. up. Come on, let's go. You want it? Anyway, here she is. <laughs> okay, so, um, here she is. So, summer venture. It sounds super fun. Tell us more about the beach. Like, was it, was it mayhem on the beach all summer? Beach all summer was kids. There were kids everywhere. Uh, they came especially for the concerts. After the concert, I would be open, and the next day they'd hang out. Most of the kids hung out on Friday, Saturday, Sunday at the beach. I would do really, really good. The first year, I just did a head shop. Then the second year, I did a head shop and a clothing show. I used to, uh, I used to go into the, the Namsby show, and there were shows in New York where you could buy bell bottoms. And funky tees. And this was new at this time. This new was clothing. new clothing. New clothing, not secondhand yet. Yeah, I started selling. Um, I started selling bell bottoms, uh, landlubber bell bottoms. I remember, and then I met a guy. Yo, for the vintage heads out there, you all know the landlubbers. Landlubbers. You own a landlubber, man. That's that legit. Was, that was the beginning of the whole thing. The whole hippy trippy drippy. Actually, we we used to wear the navy pants. Because the navies, for a hundred years, always wore bell bottoms. Yeah, they were like they were super huge bell bottoms, or these massive straight wide leg jeans yeah. with the with the back pockets and like the stencil on them. Yeah. So um, I I used to sell those. <laughs> I got them. So in you, the, those were second hand. No, those those, those I, new I got them new ones. Yeah. Okay. So okay. So we we've got a rough uh, overview of before vintage clothing, the life before vintage clothing. Well, I gotta tell you a, a, how I got in it. Yeah, so that's the thing. We want to know the story. The first time. So the first year I had the head shop. Clothing. Listen to this. The first year I had the head shop. You walked in my store, and on the right hand side I had a pole, and on that pole, on the left was all the counters, and then you walk through, and the the record rack was there, and then there were posters and shirts hanging, all kinds of funky stuff. The back wall was all black light posters. Well, that rack I had T-shirts on mostly. And we're talking music T-shirts. Peace sign t-shirts, yeah. new t-shirts. New t-shirts. Tie-dye t-shirts were big in those days. So anyway, every week I used to go, I didn't By the go. way, any one of those t-shirts from that rack at that time now, Forget oh about man, it. big money. <laughs> Forget about it. Wish you kept the box, but hey, keep going on your All show. right. So anyway, I used to send one of my guys up to Portland, Maine to get our records at least once sometimes twice a week so if Stephen Wolf was playing or three dog night I'd have racks and racks of their records I would put it on special and one time one of the guys came back I think his I don't remember his name maybe Art Buffum and Art came back and he said Dave they told me at the record place there's a costume shop in Portland going out of business now a costume shop in those days they sold costumes for theaters so if there were four or five theater companies or Halloween or whatever they had costumes for everything and this is a rental house most likely. it's a rental place yeah, so we're talking like higher-end costume stuff that would have been rental right yeah and they were closing up so I, I immediately took my van and went up to uh, Portland Maine I found out where wait, they, wait 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 are you still driving the VW van still driving the VW oh van. yeah I got the VW van <laughs> I think I might have had... got to paint a picture here because that's a pretty good picture if you ask me. It was a blue and white VW van. Anyway, um, I rode up to Portland. I found these guys and they were selling stuff for dirt. And I had, I had a bunch of... What are we of, talking dirt? Can you remember any idea of pricing? Oh, I don't know. They had like double-breasted tux jackets for three bucks and ruffle tux shirts and, and dresses from the... Uh, turn of the century, any kind of costume you can think yeah. of, hippie clothes. So, like, if you think back to that period of time, anything that he would have been buying is pre '60s. So, like, you're probably even even like World Army War II. World War II at that point had just become vintage. That's right. Because it's still only 20 years before this time, which is so crazy to think. 
Yeah. So crazy to think. So you're thinking like you're getting like all this World War II military probably, right? Yeah. You're probably getting like all turn of the century denim or like 20s, 30s, 40s denim pieces. There was everything. Like anything that they might want for a theater company, this guy's had. Yeah. They were the theater company for the state of Maine. So anyway, I made him a deal and I bought everything. So how many vans full? One van full? Two vans I think full? there were two van fulls. They came with them twice. They wanted to get rid of it. They were closing. They wanted to sell their building or whatever it was. And so that rack where I had the t-shirts, I put all these individual pieces priced one piece at a time. Because I might have they might have had ten tux jackets left or eight dresses or five army jackets. So I put them on, and that one rack was the first really vintage clothing rack in New, that I knew of in New Hampshire. Other than, of course, you could get some old stuff at, at, Sally, at Ann. A Sally Ann, yeah. or they didn't have value. That's Village, very but. different. Vintage versus thrift, <coughs> everyone knows, not the same thing. Not curated. <coughs> so, how did that rack do, Dad? Killer. Absolute killer. I was that rack I was constantly filling up daily. I mean it was it blew out. So we went through all the stuff, everything. So so how like at this time that kind of opened your eyes I guess to yeah. what's, what's possible? That was really the the wide open vision of everything for me. I said, "Wow. The stuff's used. It's like three of this, two of this, five of this." And uh, it's selling like hotcakes. Selling like hotcakes and I bought it for two and I was selling it for six or I bought it for three and I was selling it for nine. I bought it for four and I was selling it for 14. So for me it was great margin and uh, and people loved it. And the kids loved it. They, they loved it. So here, okay, this, the Sergeant Pepper jacket, is this part of the story? Or this is this is, a different story? This is a different story. How far after was that jacket? I think it was the next year. The next year? Okay, well we won't get into that story. That's for another interview okay so basically let's just wrap this up here so we, we learned about your your early days in school we learned about your first business venture which was the bookstore the head shop which turned into a head shop and vintage clothing store the first vintage clothing store of about how many did you have all in all say from then till now you still have one he still has a store today which is the rag machine which we co-own so you don't even know. This guy's had so many stores, he can't even conjure the memory of how many stores he's had. Right? Uh, yeah, you're right. One of the best ones I ever had, though, was the early 70s in Toronto called the Farmer's Rag Market. Let's run some names here. So what, Xanadu was the, was the head shop. You got the Farmer's Rag Market. There was an original rag machine, right? Yeah. There was the South Pacific Clothing Company. Yeah. There was... Um, Grass is greener. Grass is greener, which he later had something called uh, greener pastures. Obviously inspired oh, yeah. by Green, greener pastures. Inspired by Green, grass is greener. Uh, greener pastures was in Burlington, Vermont. Burlington, Vermont. Vermont. Way, Way later. Great. That was in that was, was in, in the early two thousands. No, it was no. The late nineties, early two thousands. Yeah, ninety nine into like two thousand two. Yeah. Um, greener pastures was really front. What about Buffalo? That was South Pacific. That was South Pacific and D and D Salvage. D and D Salvage. And then we had a store. Uh, uh, my friend Stan and I, Stan Small and I, had a store in St. Catharines, Ontario, called Great Northern Surplus and Salvage. Plus, you had Sergeant Bilko. Is that a store, or was that a wholesale? No, that was. But didn't you have military stores that were just Army too? Yeah, Great Northern Great Surplus Northern. and okay. Salvage. So now we're, we're at eight stores. That's that's just the surface. We probably got lots more that we're forgetting here. Uh, I'll try to remember we're some gonna, for the next. Uh, we're, yeah, we're gonna get deep into everything here. You gotta remember, I'm a. Uh, Almost 75 years old. 75 years old. That's why we're doing this. We're putting this on record here because we actually want somebody to come forward who can help us write a biography of the history of vintage clothing about Mr. Dave Heifetz. Bad about, idea. No, great idea. About other players in the vintage game, about the history that needs to be told. This is this this whole 35 minutes hasn't even we just got to the beginning of the vintage here. We haven't even started and we're still at 1968 yet. We got Woodstock to go through. We got uh, eight stores to go through. We got wholesaling to go through. We got countless scores of massive dead stock hauls to go through with this man here. There's other guys we should interview though, like Scott Rebelson. We're gonna get Scott 
out on Ed, here. Larry Horak. Larry Horak's going to be on here. And Stan Small. Boy, those guys were great people. So that is it. Uh, for today, but we are looking for a biographer to write this book. We're gonna get everything on interview so that we have all the history um, Before it's too late here, and then uh, yeah So if you if you're interested or know anyone who might be interested in writing this book hit us up Please f subscribe to this channel. We're gonna do more series with Dave the Don my dad um, And we're gonna get a lot deeper into the history nice the fun times and everything else Bye-bye. Bye-bye